Hi there, welcome to the lecture. Um, this is a lecture called A Comparison Between Chinese and Western Enterprise. Uh, I'm the lecturer today and my name is Joe Kong and I'm from South China University of Technology. Okay. So um, the contents for today's class, okay, so there are eight parts. Okay, the first part I'll do a brief self-introduction. Um, I won't keep it, I won't make it too long, okay. Uh, we'll go through things like uh, business management practices uh, and it'll be a, a comparison, of course, between the West and China. Um, we'll talk a bit about national companies as well. Um, so these are entities owned by government and we'll also look at multinational businesses uh, in the West and also China. Uh, number five, private Chinese businesses. Uh, this is not so much of a comparison but it's more about me talking about some details of um, private businesses in China. Uh, six, uh, we'll be looking at startups um, in, in China and in the West. And seven, again, this, this, this one's not a comparison, but uh, it, it will be me doing um, a overview of like some steps uh, in how to do business in China. And finally, eight, we'll have a short conclusion. So uh, for the self-introduction, um, so me, myself, um, I have a bachelor's in a global top 100 university. Um, I studied uh, accounting and finance in the University of Southampton in the UK. Um, I have experience in a big four audit firm in the UK. Uh, I worked for um, different kinds of clients such as Microsoft and other uh, different types of industries as well. Uh, I have a master's in international business from Holt Business School, where I studied in San Francisco, which is um, part of the other Bay Area, so um, in, in in America. Okay, um, and currently I've just been uh, I've just been teaching a few different subjects in uh, Scott. Okay, for the past three years. Okay, so um, I te I've, uh, I mainly teach in English, and I've also taught things like computer programming and also international finance okay and most recently i've also founded a small education business because um, education is something i'm super passionate about okay so business management practices okay whenever we talk about business management practices and uh, since we're doing a comparison between china and the west the main thing that you need to think about is are, well, are the cultural differences, okay? Um, cultural differences will be the, um, the whole kind of like uh, backbone of like what, what are like the differences between the business management practices. And one of my favorite ways to understand different cultures is to use um, Hofstede's cultural dimensions, okay? So Hofstede is a researcher and he conducted this research uh, in, in the last century and his, his work has been continuously uh, being updated. So um, ideally, like the information that we get from Hofstede's cultural dimensions about different countries uh, should, uh, should be the uh, most up-to-date, okay? So just a brief overview of the different components of Hofstede's cultural dimensions first one is um, a power distance okay power distance so power distance is all about um, people in a culture so people in a culture people in high positions of power and people with less power how do they interact okay so if there's a high if there's a high power distance that means that the people with power and the people with less power like in in for example like like a people with positions of authority, how big is the gap? Like, like um, for example, um, in terms of like communication, um, if there's a high power distance, then maybe people with less power will communicate in a less direct way to people with high power, okay? And then take into contrast, so a, a culture with a low power distance, that would be more of a flatter hierarchy 
people with um, high high power and low power can also like um, communicate maybe a bit more directly. Okay, uh, and that's something that we'll that we'll discuss between uh, China and uh, America. And I'll take America as an example for for Western countries, since uh, in terms of influence and also um, in terms of cultural influence and also economical. Uh, they would they would be the main part of uh, Western culture. Okay. Um, next is individualistic. Okay, so individualistic cultures they tend to be more focused on self rather than collectivist cultures, which are focused more on groups of people. Okay, so individualist cultures will be more about like myself like this is my identity this these are my achievements this is what like i want this is what i have to say collectivist cultures will think more about oh uh, maybe um this is what my my country wants this is um the ideals of my family this these are the ideals of my school this is my my company's goals uh, but not my but not my own goals okay Next is masculine and feminine. Okay, this one's a little bit tricky to understand at first. Uh, lots of um, students I've taught in the past are maybe a, li a little bit confused about what this actually means. This doesn't mean like, okay, one country is like just full of men and another country is full of women. Okay, that's incorrect. But um, what it means is that um, the actual values of the, of the country, so a masculine country, okay, um, their, their values are more focused like on more um, okay um, masculine types of things so for example like economic achievement um, social status uh, things like um, yeah more related to that area whereas the feminine side is more about like collaboration um, it's more about like the um, quality of living things like that okay and of course with any of these you can also uh, read about this in more detail if you want to get a, a deeper understanding. Okay. Um, another part as well. So next is um, uncertainty avoidance. Okay. So um, uncertainty avoidance is like how willing a country or culture is willing to accept uncertainty and how they're going to deal with this uncertainty. Okay. Um, and there will be a comparison, of course, about this. Long term, short term, pretty straightforward long-term orientation the culture it's more focused on long-term values and long-term thinking whereas short-term tend to be more uh, short-term orientated like uh, trying to um, get a more instant gratification okay and the final one is indulgence versus restraint okay so indulgence meaning that the culture um, prefers to indulge in pleasures and to um, to seek pleasures, whereas restraint is more of if it's more of the opposite of uh, a country being more uh, disciplined and restraint from seeking pleasures. Okay, so that's a very brief overview. Okay, so over here you can see some data collected. This is the most uh, recent from Hofstede Insights. Okay, so there's actually a website that you can actually check and. You can also have a look yourself. You can also put in other countries, just play around with it, read a bit more about Hofstede. I really recommend this for uh, understanding different cultures as like a preliminary, like, as like a, like a, as, as like a um, preliminary research. Okay, I would recommend that. Um, but an another thing to mention is that whenever you're looking and talking about cultures, um, it's very important that you also understand what's happening on the ground level. So you actually travel to these places and you can also experience firsthand about these uh, types of uh, differences. Okay. So anyway, the, the uh, comparison. Okay. So power distance. Okay. So as you might have guessed in Western cultures, well, in the United States, uh, the power distance tends to be a little lower, standing at a score of 40 out of 100, whereas for China, it's 80, so you would expect China to be a bit more hierarchical um, in, in terms of their business management practices, okay. Uh, individualism, okay, so the United States scores a 91, so a lot of it is about your personal achievements, your gains and what, and what you want, okay. 
whereas in China uh, that, that that's 20 so that's quite that's two quite big extremes that so what what that means for business practices is that what you'll see is that for business management uh, in the United States a lot of it will be, will be about your own personal um, achievements and your and that will be closely monitored your goals every year for example whereas in China you it, it might be based more upon like what your team has succeeded what your what 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 kind of, what your department has done and what kind of success it's had okay in terms of masculinity um, China and United States uh, are fairly similar okay so China at 66 United States at 62 okay so that means that in terms of um, the masculinity both of them um, China and United States tend to be a bit more on the masculine side of uh, cult culture so that means that things like um, economic achievement social status uh, that's going to be driving people a little more but not too much so that means that uh, in China people still and America people still uh, value things like collaboration and also enjoying life at the same time okay uncertainty avoidance okay so this is how much um, the countries will um, avoid uncertainty okay so what we can see here is that China has a lower score of 30 compared to the United States of 46 though both of them are fairly low okay so that means China and America both can deal with uncertainty okay China at a lower score of 30 okay so they can tolerate uh, more ambiguous situations on, and uncertainty uh, more um, more usually and United States here is at 46 okay so my ideas about this may be um, because China's fast and rapid growth you know we're talking about decades of growth condensed into I mean sorry centuries of growth condensed into decades here so and also like we're talking about a developing nation as well and so uncertainty is definitely part of the game it's, it's gonna there's gonna be a lot of this United States uh, also quite good with dealing with uncertainty and another and a reason could be that is the different um, different cultures within the United States and how they they work together that's going to create more ambiguous and uncertain situations okay next uh, long-term orientation again over here we have a big difference China being more long-term oriented okay United States being more short-term um, and in, in terms of business management practices you might see that United States a lot of businesses um, and other Western uh, businesses, they might be focused on the yearly annual reports, the um, month, um, so the annual yearly um, achievements. Whereas in China, um, they might um, forego for like some annual achievement, but focus more on the next maybe five or ten years um, in, instead. Okay. In terms of indulgence, again, we have some big differences. Um, United States, 68, so it's more pleasure-seeking. And China at 24, so it's less pleasure-seeking. So, uh, so this affects the, the workplace. Maybe in the United States, um, things like um, some indulgences after work, for example, some after work drinks, they might be a lot more common in the United States compared to in China, where this is only at 24. Okay, so it's more of a disciplined and restraint culture compared to the West. Okay. Okay. Some other key things I would like to talk about that didn't really quite fit into the Hofstede model. Okay. Um, and these are more related to Chinese business, since I think most of you will have a better idea of Western practices. Okay. So something in China um, that affects. Uh, relationships in business a lot is something called face okay so that means that people um, will care a lot about um, their image um, and their reputation okay uh, yeah I think reputation here would be a better word to describe this so it's not actually the actual physical face okay uh, <laughs> uh, 
uh, but it's more about the reputation. Okay, so 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 it's like you know, people want to uh, uh, like people want others to believe that they they have a high reputation and they have honor and they will, they're reliable. They will keep their word. Things like that. Okay, um, so it's very important in China not to um, go against face and not to like. Um, it's important to preserve uh, someone else's face, okay? And if you mess with that, especially if the person is uh, your manager or your boss, um, you might have some uh, problems there, okay? Guanxi, another really important Chinese concept, okay? And in ways, it goes a bit more deeper with typical Western um, uh, relationships. Guanxi. Uh, in Chinese businesses is very, very deep connections. The reason why uh, behind this, and you can also do research on this, the reason why is because uh, in Chinese workplaces, um, there's less of a difference between yourself as a w at work and then yourself personally. It's all personal. Like for example, um, people use WeChat in China. WeChat is a personal communication social media platform. But the thing is, people also use this for work. So the boundaries uh, between work and your personal life aren't really there. So Guanxi, especially on the business sense, actually is also touching into the personal sense as well. So to, to succeed in business in China, you need, you need to understand that. You need to understand that people are going to want a more um, personal approach to a lot of um, um, interactions. For example, if you're doing sales, it's very common to be a bit more personal and to share a bit more uh, information rather than keeping it strictly professional. Okay. And definitely in China, if someone wants to add your WeChat for business purposes, um, that's typically a way to go, for, to, to go forward and it's something that uh, perhaps shouldn't be declined. Okay. Another thing as well um, that affects a lot of uh, Chinese business management is Confucian ideals that are embedded into Chinese culture. So before what we saw about um, collectivism, things about like long-term um, views, a lot of this actually comes down to um, the big cultural influence in China, which comes from Confucian ideals. Okay, so that's also something to read about. Okay. Uh, to get further understanding of so, some of the um, nuances in China, okay. Indirect communication, okay. In China, uh, communication tends to be indirect, okay. It's something to um, get accustomed to, and um, most of the time, people will will um, expect you to get the hint rather than being uh, you being told something directly, okay. And this also ties into silence as well. Okay, silence is also like an indirect type of communication. And silence means a lot in China. Okay. So in the West, typically silence just means silence. And sometimes silence can be disturbing as well. Um, if you're just silent with someone, that could be seen as strange. Okay. But in China, silence is, is okay. It's, it's not a necessarily bad thing. And f if, if, for example, you're working with somebody and you ask them a question and there's silence or you're, you're expecting some sort of um, interaction, it, it doesn't necessarily mean rudeness or someone's not listening. Sometimes in Chinese culture, silence could mean that they've, they've listened actually very seriously and deeply, but they need time to reflect and to give a valuable answer back to you. And of course, a, a silence can also be used as a form of aggression. <laughs> uh, if somebody, you, if you, if you, if you're asking somebody something and they really are just completely silent, um, sometimes um, that could be that could mean that they're they're actually angry with you. They're not actually happy with you. So you really do have to look at the context and the the feeling and energy. Okay. Uh, final thing. Um, Flexibility of contracts. So this one's a bit more concrete. Um, in China, uh, you w you do have contracts, of course, but um, they're a lot more flexible. Um, in the West, the, the the typical law practices are very very strict, especially where I'm from in the UK. 
um, law practices and contracts, they really mean um, that's what it means. Okay. Whereas in, in China, yeah, not always like that. So that's something to be careful of. But it doesn't mean that like one is better and one is worse. It, it just means that in China, uh, things can be negotiated. It's flexible. Uh, it just requires more of a personal and, and human touch when it comes down to negotiations and contracts. Okay. But overall, like, even though we talk about all of these cultural differences and how these affects uh, business management practices, um, according to King and Zhang, okay, we have some research here, um, cultural divide between leadership in China and the West would be less different nowadays compared to two or three decades ago. Okay, so continuously, um, China and the West are learning from each other. And Chinese culture is highly influenced by uh, Western culture. So we'll, we'll expect um, these differences to be less and less in the future, like it is now, for, for example. Okay. All right, so moving on to national companies, so state-owned enterprises. Okay. So, um, national companies, state-owned enterprises. Large factor of the quantity and size of state-owned enterprises are political and economic styles. So that means, well, over there, what that means is that a large factor um, concerning like how, how many state-owned enterprises there are and their size is determined by the political and economical styles of the country. So in general, the West tends to favor free market capitalism, okay? And in China, um, it's, it's a communist country, so it's more focused on um, state-owned enterprise, but there's also a lot of free market capitalism happening in China as well. Like, you know, you can own a business, you can own a house, you can have assets, uh, and you can be a, a capitalist as well, okay, in China. Okay, so let's talk a bit about US as an example, again, representing the West, okay. Um, so over here, over here we can see some um, public companies such as the US Postal Service, Amtrak, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, okay. These are all examples of public companies in America and all of them are famous but not necessarily famous for good reasons okay for example Fannie Mae Freddie Mac uh, 2008 um, financial crisis um, you know all, all, like all of these are examples of um, economic failure on a grand scale so what happened was that these companies were originally private and they operated in that way However, they were unsuccessful, and there were some economic failures that uh, were underlying this. Okay, so for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, it was, at the time, it was all about the um, mortgages, subprime mortgages, and this you can read in more detail. You can have a whole lecture on this. Um, but um, yeah, basically, these companies end up being bought out by the government using like uh, the Fed's money. So. Um, they actually end up becoming state-owned enterprises because um, the the damage. Um, what 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 the thinking behind it is because if if it's left to fail, the damage on the economy would be so so bad. Okay, because these services are very important, and because these businesses employ lots of people, they actually have a significant role in the economy. So then, in the end. They would get some. Um, they would be bought out and get some support from the government. Okay, and this is very different from from China. Let's have a look. Okay, so over here. Okay, again, China is a communist country and has a very strong government leadership. Okay, um, so what we can see here is a list of state-owned enterprise businesses in China. Okay. And this is data taken from Forbes Global 2000. And th these are basically a list of, of um, sorry, I'm, I'm in the way there. But um, this, is, this is a list of uh, businesses in terms of size. I know there, there is JP Morgan Chase here, and that's an, an American business, an, an American bank. 
But the, the point I want to get across here is that in, in China, it's very, very common for big businesses, very, very like key sector big businesses like banking, to be state owned. Okay, and you can see here that some of the biggest businesses in the world, like the Industrial and Commercial Bank of China, okay, they have huge sales, 177 billion, huge profits, 45 billion uh, in in US dollars, and assets humongous, 4,300. Okay, and you, we can see here that there there are quite a few banks here which are of this size. Okay. So you, you have an idea of the kind of scale here that we're talking about, okay? So what, what, what's, what's going on here? So basically, um, um, you know, this is basically the political differences and also cultural differences, okay? The, uh, communism, um, in a lot of ways, uh, ties in with Confucianism, where it's more about like um, equality, balance, and harmony, okay? So um, what's happening is that the Chinese government are keeping control of key industries uh, which allow for strict control of their economy and also surveillance, okay? And that also deters foreign companies or any like one uh, person or one like business from dominating too much, okay? So the, so the Chinese government will actually control this, okay? Uh, the main sectors where they do control um, will be uh, mainly banking, that's one of the main ones, but also like telecommunications, um, lots of the key like industries uh, happening in China. Um, and and for more details on that, that, that's definitely something that can be researched more upon as well. Okay, so we see there some differences. Okay. Uh, oh, and yeah, so, so here more like uh, examples of these uh, key national companies in China. So over here we have all of these are state owned. Okay, so this is data taken from from uh, the 2019 Fortune list. So some really big companies. We see logistics services, oil, utilities, telecommunications, automotive, construction, and all of these are really really key industries to you know make make a country like you know. You know, develop quickly. You need things like lo logistics, postal services. You need railways, and China's railways are extremely good, and it, uh, for such a large country as well. Okay, uh, and also areas like banking, like we mentioned before. Okay, so you, so you just get a rough idea over here. Okay, so moving on. Um, multinationals. Okay, Chinese multinational firms. Okay, so so. China has multinational firms, but are they really multinational? Questionable, debatable. Okay. Um, a very famous example, Huawei. Um, yes, they operate globally, they sell globally, um, but you know, there's been some politics there. You know, they're not, for example, they're not allowed to sell in, in, the, in the United States, and they also have some uh, businesses that, that's been um, rescinded, so it's been like, later declined. For example, in the UK with 5G, okay. Um, but the thing is with a lot of Chinese businesses, like even though they might sell internationally, so you might see them on, for example, Amazon selling internationally, um, but you will find that for most cases that these businesses um, are mainly getting their money from domestic uh, customers, okay. And in terms of their operations and like, like things like uh, offices and where their employees are based, most of that is in China st still. Okay, so the question about Chinese multi multinational firms and are they really multinational is very, very debatable. And, but if we take the West, for example, there's a whole list of Western multinational firms like Coca-Cola, Google, Amazon, Ford, Microsoft, General Electric, um, GE. And these companies are definitely multinational. Like, like, when, like when we think of multinational firms, these are the big brands that we're all thinking about. You know, we see Coca-Cola everywhere. Google's used in so many countries. Amazon's operating in so many countries. They have employees nearly everywhere. They have offices nearly everywhere. And you can see that their products used 
all over the world. Okay. So, um, multinationals. Um, so, basically, like a lot of these multinationals, but not all. Okay, a lot of them. For example, um, Ford, uh, General Electric. Okay. These kinds of multinational companies, okay, um, they were built by entrepreneurship, okay, and entrepreneurship was a big part of cult of the culture in the U.S. Okay, since the later part of the 19th century, okay, which was leading to the height, to its height in the Second Industrial Revolution uh, between the years 1865 to 1920, okay. So a lot of these companies were being built at this time, okay, and. To give you some sort of example of what was happening during this time, things like the light bulb were invented during this time. Sk skyscrapers were being built, so this really was taking America to a next kind of like economical and industrial level in terms of like the quality of labor force and the services and products provided. Okay. So. Why, why exactly, why exactly are multinationals in China, um, why exactly are multinationals in China not being like fully operational all over the world and why are they not true multinationals, okay? Well, one of the first things is that the West has been developed for longer, okay, like I mentioned about, um, about the US and how the second industrial revolution was in the, the uh, 1800s and the 1900s, okay? That was a long time ago. We're talking about centuries of growth again, okay? Uh, China is still developing, okay? We're talking about only decades, okay? Um, operating as a multinational, um, when English is the world's trade language, there's huge advantages of this, okay? So, um, so corporations um, generally will speak in English for, for multinationals, uh, whereas in China, uh, English is not the first language, and the differences between Chinese and English are huge. So to expect like many, many Chinese to learn English to a very high level and to uh, understand and adapt to the culture, this, this is something that takes a, a long time. And um, things like building software, or building hard things, like technical things, the changes happen quickly. You can just, you build a railway and, and, it's, and, it, and it's just there once you have the technology and the, the labor to do it. But things with people, people take much longer to change. So to, like they take longer to educate and in general, people tend to be more stubborn, okay? Uh, another thing is uh, Western culture. Um, Western culture being more dominant and thus equating to global culture, it makes it more easy for a Western multinational to operate in that sort of way, okay? So people will be more accepting of um, the business management practices and in general, their cultures, okay? And another thing as well is politics as well. Like I like to take Huawei as a, as a very good example uh, because they've been in the news a lot recently. They've been very successful um, selling products all over the world, but they, they've been sanctioned in, in the US and they definitely have been messed around with a lot in politics to stop their growth, to stop them from becoming a, a real true multinational company. E uh, Though it's state debatable, Huawei is still a very su successful company, but this politics area also uh, will happen a lot with other types of uh, Chinese businesses. Okay, so will China eventually have more true, fully multinationals? Probably yes, okay, most likely, okay. And the reasons are uh, developing countries, they have a lot of room for growth. Um, because the, the type of innovation that you need for a developed country to, to, to keep on maintaining growth is you know, it's a lot. Whereas for a developing country, um, yes, developing countries also will innovate, 
but it's not reliant on innovation to continue growth. Okay, for example, then like I, I take China for example, since I live here now. Um, in China, like you, you might see like even in like a tier one city such as Guangzhou, okay, you might see some like skyscrapers, amazing. Um, public transport, yeah, sure, it's it's like world leading in that sense, okay. Guangzhou Tower is amazing, like it's a, it's a very tight, it's, it's, I think it's the second tallest uh, structure in the world or something like that. Um, the trains here are very good. Um, but at the same time, you will see huge contrasts, like you, like that's why people in China, they, they have a term called uh, a village within the city. And that basically means that there's literally like um, areas which are so underdeveloped in the city, like they're literally looking like villages, okay? So there's still a large um, opportunity for growth, even in tier one cities, okay? And then once you take tier two, new tier one, tier three, tier four, and lower, you can sort of see like how, how huge this uh, potential is, okay? The next thing is, um, Chinese culture, um, in general, there's a very strong focus on education and economic achievement. So many parents in China tend to push kids to study hard. And also um, kids in general, um, they, they tend, it, it's, it, it's, it's weird to say this, but it's, it, it's actually sometimes cool to be nerdy in, in China. Okay? And, and definitely for my upbringing in the UK, this wasn't always the case. Okay? So there's a strong culture of education here, and and people are expected to um, achieve economically as well. This again ties into face values, uh, like you know, a, a person will have face, and their family will also have face as well. They want their kids to be of like the of a high, even higher economic achievement than themselves. Okay, so this is a strong underlying underlying force of what pushes China, what motivates people. Next, uh, English learning is becoming a much bigger thing in China. Um, so in general, um, again, like China's just, Chinese is so different from English. So um, it's just very hard for many Chinese to learn English. Um, but English learning is being focused on a lot by the government. Okay, so they've recently released uh, new exams called like KTPT uh, types of exams, which are for um, uh, old, pr older primary school kids or middle school kids, and it, the, the, these types of exams really are like um, comparable to to a native level. Okay, so that doesn't mean that like China will like suddenly have a bunch of native speakers, but um, we'll expect to see a lot more people um, with a higher level skill of English. Okay, and that helps with multinationals because you know the language barriers and also when when you're learning a language that actually opens you up to learning a culture as well okay so if you're in china you're studying here or you're at least studying in a in a chinese university uh, i recommend definitely uh, push yourself to learn the language uh, and that will help you to learn a lot about the culture as well okay next part is um, more experience so uh, uh, the current multinationals of china which are maybe like in between debatable level of multinational, uh, they will just get more experience naturally over the, over the years. Um, this could be direct experience, like they themselves are operating internationally, or they could have ownership, they could have foreign investments, uh, and there will be uh, open communication between those investments, and they will get experience through their investments in that sense. So it's more of an indirect a way of getting experience. And just in general as well, like um, there's, because there's, there's a shift in, in, uh, in like global forces here, like, you know, China, the West, you know, uh, trade wars, stuff like that. Um, it, uh, th this is all part of a natural process um, where like um, a, a new power is emerging and in, in general, the general public uh, over time will be more accustomed with Chinese multinationals and accepting that not all are, qu are low quality or copycat products. Okay. 
and definitely um, Chinese products that I've seen. And since I live here, I buy a lot of Chinese products and research them extensively. Uh, the products, like year on year, they're improving extremely fast. Some areas like um, cars, Chinese cars still aren't quite there yet. Okay, but um, the they year on year improvement of the actual technologies are, are huge. And it's something comparable to uh, Japan in the last century, that kind of growth. And, and nowadays, Japan has some of the most reliable uh, cars and super uh, strong technology in, in with cars right now. Uh, other areas that, that China have done really well in products, uh, phones, Huawei is an, uh, an example. Uh, their, their battery life uh, tends to be some of the best in the market. Their camera is also very good as well. Okay. Okay, next, moving on. Uh, private Chinese business. Uh, so businesses in, in China which are private, most of them, most of these, so this, is, this isn't a comparison, but most of these businesses are just owned by everyday people in China. Uh, private Chinese businesses are basically the backbone of the Chinese economy and its middle class. Okay, so since, since uh, the, the country is so big, there's so many uh, opportunities for people to start up their own businesses and to, uh, to, to, to do business like locally, like maybe within a town, within a city, within a province. And a lot of this is based upon what we said earlier about Guangxi, again, how important it is. So a lot of these businesses are, are based upon that. Okay. Um, so in general, okay, so private, private Chinese businesses are not restricted to just Chinese. The foreigners can also uh, be a part of this, okay? So I just want to also briefly touch upon why um, it might be favorable to open up a private business in China, okay? So some, um, and, and these are also some reasons for why myself I would open up my own business as well. Um, so there's no secrets here, okay? Um, number one, huge domestic demand. Um, because there's such huge demands in China, there's you know, a huge population and uh, so the markets are very big. Um, if you have a business idea and, and you want to start small, um, it's likely that you can and you, you can get some sort of um, demand coming in because there's just a lot out there. Okay, um, As long as you're focusing on areas which are less competitive and um, um, maybe initially less technology based. For example, like um, if you're trying to do like online business or like um, like maybe like, um, well, uh, for example, my business is education, right? There's a reason why I didn't pick MOOC education to start off the business because um, the, type of, the type of investment would be higher and the type of competition that you would face would be much, much higher, okay? Um, however, if I open up a physical branch kind of school the, there's such huge domestic demand that that um, I, I, I still get local customers who would pick a small, uh, young uh, starting business. Okay, and this also relates to other businesses as well. Okay, um, number two, a huge array of factories to offer products to start your business. China is the fact; it's a global factory. Okay, it's a factory of the world. Uh, that means that that there's there's a lot of products here you can buy to start your business. Whatever stuff you need, it's very easy to buy in China. You just need the right connections, or or you just need to be able to use uh, Chinese apps like Taobao, Jingdong, um, and, and buy stuff. You know that those those platforms are super super useful, um, and that's something that I'll talk about in in number five as well. Uh, three, uh, rent is relatively low compared to real estate price in China versus the West. That's another, that's another key area. Uh, this doesn't mean that China Chinese rent is low. I mean, you can, you can, there's also very high high rent as well. But in general, if you just like s compare the facts and the data, you, if you take um, real estate price as a fraction of rent, you'll see that Chinese real estate is super expensive. But if you want to rent, if you want to just start a business, uh, the rent is is not super high in China. And and that's for both like living and commercial as well. Commercial and living rent from my experience in China, tends to be uh, fairly similar prices. Um, per capita salaries, they're still not very high in China on average um, because 
um, in general, like China, Chinese economic models, um, the, the, um, hang on one sec. Um, because the Chinese economic model still heavily relies on lower labor costs and also like lower product product prices as well. Um, but over time, uh, we're talking about maybe a decade or two, or maybe more. Who, who knows? Um, we could see um, labor labor costs increasing a lot. It, it already is, and also product prices as well. Um, so in in this sense, um, in terms of the economic model of China because previously it tended to be more export driven. Um, so what, what, will, what will happen is that you know, there will be eventually be a, 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 a flip over there in terms of the, um, the currency in China, because right now in the long term, it, it will be undervalued. Uh, to, and this is way beyond the scope of this course, but to, to research this, you would need to look into um, into general economics, like micro and macroeconomics, and look at the structure of China and look at things, especially the um, monetary policies of China and, and also their, their, their trade balance as well, okay? If you're interested in that. Okay, for five, um, a, a point I mentioned already, the technology is just super useful here, like WeChat Pay, Alipay. Uh, if you want to set up businesses, uh, you, can, you can set up really, really quickly um, with like low, um, with low restrictions, like you can just receive payments on WeChat Pay and Alipay. Um, legal side questionable, but again, like China in general flexible. Um, um, things like Taobao, Jingdong, you can buy lots of products for your businesses. You can find lo lots of um, products there for businesses. It's very useful. Uh, Zhao Pin uh, is a app um, it's an example of an app that uh, helps you like get people working for you. Uh, you can also use other ones as like Boss or something like that. That's one I, I've seen lots of adverts for, and it's very easy to to use these platforms and get started. Okay, very useful. Okay, startups. Okay, U.S. West. Okay, so um, U.S. like they tend to have started. Uh, sorry, they, they, tend, they tended to have dominated startups in general. Um, basically, uh, the US and West in general have more favorable financial markets. Okay? And a key thing about this is, well, first of all, the experience. Okay? And also the level of trust, security, and reputation play a key role as well in why these areas are um, financial, like, um, you know, uh, elites, for example, like cities like in London and uh, New York, these are some of the top financial institutions in the world. Sorry, not institutions, uh, cities. Um, another thing is that um, fina uh, venture capitalists um, they sprouted up in America in the 1970s. Okay, uh, this is in the U.S. Okay, um, and this is during like the the huge like te technological growth. Okay, so lots of huge um, tech businesses uh, came out came out during this time. Okay, um, and this is in contrast to China, where uh, venture capital only came out in the 1990s. Okay, okay, so you can see here that the U.S. and the West in general have a lot more experience. Okay. Um, Another thing is the traditional organizations um, that have like, helped to form or were originally startups, you know, such as Oracle, Cisco, um, some older traditional organizations, technology startups, and also um, some, some key um, venture capital players at the time, Sequoia Capital, okay. These kinds of players help startup organizations a lot. Um, like Sequoia Capital are aggressively looking for um, for investments all the time. Oracle and Cisco kind of like helped to create a culture of like you know technology and startups. Okay, and also Stanford University, like being in like the the Bay Area in the West, um, having like access to the smartest students in the world and also like um, top students from internationally coming over to your area. It helps a lot of startup innovation and 
it helps uh, people to uh, create ideas and to communicate. Okay. There's also some newer organizations, like key organizations in the West as well, like uh, the newer startups like Uber, Airbnb, that have become like uh, super big. And also like a newer, a more like a newer down to earth type of venture capital, like through like uh, Y Combinator. So this is more of like what's called an accelerator, which is basically um, an earlier stage of investing. And they, they tend to help founders on a more ground level, uh, like given like really key advice to them uh, and hoping to nurture them. And then eventually, um, if they're successful uh, in Y Combinator and like things like Techstars, they can much more easily gain access to later rounds of funding with like bigger venture capital firms like Sequoia Capital uh, and Recent Horowitz, for example. Startups in China. Okay, so um, China has had a big boom in startups. Um, and a lot of this was inspired by the current tech giants like, Ten like uh, Tencent and Alibaba, etc. Okay. So startups is a big thing in China and becoming bigger. Okay. And it comes down to Chinese culture. Okay. Um, a lot of startup uh, businesses, you know, it brings you closer down to um, some of the uh, more um, deeper human types of behavior. And uh, there's a huge survival mentality uh, in Chinese culture and there's brute competition. And this is applied to the startups here. Okay, so startups in China Okay, like it's super competitive. Okay, like lots of things happen, like you know, s things in the gray area, something sometimes like underhand tricks, um, just like um, getting lots of uh, venture capital money, like pumping money in to like um, basically like um, beat out the other competition. Okay, so it's a big thing. And, and, and another thing about um, why startups in China also have a lot of um, potential um, is that. Um, businesses and entrepreneurs still have a huge mission to improve everyday lives for a large part of China. Like I mentioned, um, China is still a developing country uh, per capita. Um, GDP on average is fairly low and and the quality of living in like lower tier cities, um, uh, less developed areas, there's still a huge difference here. And all of these startups, uh, technologies, for example, uh, services, um, they can be used to to improve these um, these areas and the large part of China. Okay. Um, however, uh, the thing is with a lot of startups and businesses in general in China is that the ability to go global still isn't quite there yet, but will happen one day in the future, potentially soon. Okay, so next, next we're going to talk about doing business in China. So um, these are some quick tips which I'll just quickly uh, run through. First of all, make sure you, you do market research. Who are you selling to and what are you selling? And how you do this? Okay, make sure you have that in your mind, like at the beginning. Make sure, okay, you, 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 know, you know, don't think too complicated at first. Think about, okay, how can you make money? Think survival first. Okay, that's the main thing. Um, and then afterwards, um, you might want to choose a business structure. There's joint venture options. That's uh, if you have shared ownership and control with yourself and a domestic uh, Chinese, a, a native Chinese uh, representative, representative office. Um, that one is... That one most of you wouldn't really need. That is more of like part of like a bigger organization or more for like um, government officials. Like that's like representative offices. They can't actually earn money and revenue, so they actually just use mainly as like a support function entity of a business or maybe as a communication entity. Okay, wholly foreign-owned business uh, enterprise, WFOE. Um, this is an, an impeding option, but it takes longer to uh, start up. Um, but this is this this uh, enterprise will be fully owned um, by uh, 
the, the foreign entity. And there's different ways you can do this, and you would need to do more research to find out. Uh, and finally, is umbrella company. And these are more looser based uh, business entities. And if you're just starting out a business uh, and you're not really sure how far it's going to go, or you don't really want to spend that much money and time sorting out the legal processes, umbrella companies uh, could be a good way to start. Next, you need to choose a legal firm to help you in the process. Um, they will consult you and your company about how to actually form a business. Okay, so even though I'm giving you this advice, I'm not a lawyer and I don't have all of the technical background to support you with this. So you need a lawyer. Okay. Um, you also need to choose a business scope as well. Um, because this needs to actually be written down for when you're actually applying, you know, and to start up your business. Okay, um, it shouldn't be too broad and it shouldn't be too narrow. Okay, the idea is that if it's too broad, that your business is going into too many industry areas and some of them might be restricted, so you might get um, restricted. You might get denied. If it's too narrow, later on, your, when your business grows, you might uh, increase your scope of business. And then you might not be operating under that narrow scope anymore, and your business might get shut down. Okay, so plan ahead for the future. Get the necessary information that you need, like name of your business, lists of controlling partners, what's your managerial structure. Okay. You need a legal address of your company, so you need some sort of like office. You need your articles of association as well. Um, you also need like some information about your registered capital and total investment. Registered capital is just basically the upfront capital that you want to put into your business. This eventually needs to be put in a bank. Total investment also includes the registered capital, but it also includes um, future loans as well. Okay. A feasibility study, sometimes this needs to be done for businesses which have a high uh, fixed cost or starting costs. Um, it's basically to make sure that the business isn't going to go bankrupt within like a few months or a few years. Okay, So it's just basically looking at the basic um, investment and like doing some basic um, uh, discounted cash flows to just test that, okay, this business will maybe make money in the future and isn't going to just fail straight away. Um, you need to apply for approval with responsible authorities like the Ministry of Commerce, MOFCOM, and the State Administra uh, Administration of Industry of Commerce, like SAIC. That's just what needs to be done. And then once you get the approval certificate, you need to apply for a business license. Okay. And then once you get a business license, you have to open up your bank account and you deposit your registered capital. Okay, and that's most of it. But then number nine, you have some key activities you need to do. And this list doesn't cover everything. It's just some key points. Uh, you might need to apply. You, uh, um, you might need to get approval from the PSB, Public Security Bureau. Um, you might need to register with the Tax Bureau. You have to register with the Customs Office. You have to register with SAFE, the State Administration of Foreign Exchange. And you should probably hire an accountant as well because the accounts need to be done professionally and have to be um, submitted uh, so that you can uh, pay your your business taxes as well. Okay, and in general, that's most of the information uh, of this course. Okay, so if you have any questions, um, you can uh, think about it and you can ask uh, whoever is available to you. Okay, um, and overall, like we've covered, like. Um, both like Chinese and Western business management practices, some cultural differences, and we've covered things about like multinational businesses, state-owned enterprise, startups, uh, doing business in China, private businesses in China. Okay, and it's all been very very brief. Okay, uh, definitely if you want to get more details, you need to do a lot more reading, and you need to experience more as well. Okay, so you know, good luck. And I hope you got some useful information from this course. Okay, thank you.